So everybody, hey, thanks for coming out here. We're towards the tail end of KubeCon. We're, we're staying awake, it's great, it's great. Uh, welcome to uh, charting your own course through the cloud native ecosystem. And uh, my name is Maddie Stratton. And I'm Whitney Lee, lovely to meet y'all. So I first started learning Kubernetes about two years ago. I remember talking with my dad on the phone, telling him I was starting to learn this new technology and I was trying to describe to him how overwhelming it felt for me. It feels like I'm learning a plate of spaghetti, I said. Not only am I trying to memorize the shape and the placement of every noodle, but I'm also trying to understand why, how every noodle touches every other noodle and why. I remember Kubernetes felt so complex to the point of it seeming magical and as random and arbitrary as trying to understand a plate of pasta. Where does one even start? So everyone has a story. Maddie and I are each going to share ours, and we ask that you reflect on your journey, too. So my name is Maddie Stratton. My uh, background, oh, oh, everything's going too fast. OK, it's fine. Um, first time using uh, iPhone clicker. It's all right. It's totally good. Uh, I've, I've spent a couple decades working in operations, so my background is kind of traditional. Um, jumping ahead, I, years ago, uh, when I wanted to learn more about DevOps, I decided the best way to do that was to start a podcast, uh, really because I felt there wasn't uh, content that was beginner friendly in that area. And one of the really uh, fun little secrets about uh, running a tech podcast is it's a way to get people to come and spend an hour talking to you when they might not necessarily spend that time uh, any other way. So I had an opportunity to learn a lot from, from folks in the industry of all kinds of different ways from doing the podcast. I also spent years uh, and continue to, as a conference organizer, I started the DevOps Day Chicago conference years ago. I'm one of the global organizers for DevOps Days around the world. And that's been a way that I've learned things because you put programs together, you're exposed to those things. And then over time, I myself, uh, wow, that just totally ruined the joke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, there's a delay on my clicker. <laughs> wow, okay. Well, forget that part. Um, <laughs> the story of that, though, was uh, I used to have the license plate DevOps on my car, and then I moved to California, and when I moved back to Illinois, I actually couldn't get the DevOps license plate because I, I already had it, but they wouldn't give it back to me because bureaucracy. So I needed something clever and came up with, uh, with having KubeCuddle, even though I actually really didn't use Kubernetes very much. One of the side benefits of that license plate, though, is uh, if the police are ever looking for me, they won't be able to find me because they won't be able to tell each other what my license plate is because they'll all argue about how to pronounce it. <laughs> I figure we'll be fine. And, uh, but then I went and I worked at Red Hat and uh, helping organizations through their transformation using OpenShift, which meant I had to learn a lot about Kubernetes because OpenShift is a platform built on, on Kubernetes. So, so working through that gave me a requirement to learn that now today I work at Pulumi and I do a lot with that both in helping folks who are using Pulumi to build and deploy and manage their Kubernetes environments, but also myself, I'm building, I'm building things for demos, for workshops. So it's really given me this need to have this hands-on kind of applicable approach to, uh, to my learning about um, Kubernetes. Mine, so I am a career changer. I've spent most of my adult life as a wedding photographer. I was a wedding photographer for 10 years. I photographed, I've been to over 500 weddings. So at the end though, the business ran me instead of me running the business. I was super stressed and ready for a change. So when my brother's band, Mutual Benefit, got some notoriety and he wanted to go on tour, he invited me to play keys in the band and to sing harmonies. So I jumped at the chance. So I uh, spent all my savings giving my wedding clients back their money. My partner at the time wasn't supportive. We'd been together eight years, gone. <laughs> and I put all my stuff into storage and I lived address free for a year touring in a band. Then when I got back, I wasn't sure what to do next. My son was in college studying uh, software engineering and he was like, hey mom, mom, you would like this, you should try it out. And so I did and I really enjoyed it. So I ended up going to a boot camp. I wrote my first line of code in January, 2019. 
I spent um, hundreds of hours getting ready for boot camp. Once I was in boot camp, it started in July. I spent, I did 11 hour days, six days a week for three months, graduated in October. So, um, and then in November, I got a job as a cloud developer, <laughs> just like that. So I, uh, I worked in a pre-sales team. Oh, thank yeah. you, that's so nice. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I worked in a pre-sales team at IBM and we'd put together proof of concepts for clients, but work was on or off. And so when I didn't have work to do on the side, I would make YouTube videos from behind the light board. I honestly couldn't believe they let me behind the light board when I was so green. But I think that's part of what made my videos good is that I really explained stuff at a beginner level. So all in all, I made seven light board videos for the IBM Cloud YouTube channel and those have um, a half a million views altogether. So then I realized, actually, this is what I want my career to be, <laughs> not the pre-sales stuff. And so I got hired as a developer advocate at VMware Tanzu. And I've been working really hard to learn Kubernetes the last few years and, and learn it well and be able to teach it. And now I have a show called Enlightening. So from behind the light board, I'll have a guest come on and explain a technical concept to me. And I'll draw out the concept as I understand it. A show looks like this. This is my mentor, Rick, came on and taught me how you add persistent storage to your Kubernetes application. That's me. So, so when we're looking at a big topic like Kubernetes, like different things in the ecosystem, it can seem very overwhelming. And it can seem very overwhelming because, well, it is very overwhelming. There's a lot to it. And we you know, kind of look at that, and I don't know if you know this or not, but the internet is vast. There are a lot of resources out there. So, how do we start researching a big topic? And one of the things that really helps is to have a planned pattern that you can repeat. So we're gonna talk about this, uh, this cycle that we continue to repeat. And if you think about it, if you've worked in you know, agile software development, you think about DevOps, all these things, this cycle looks kind of familiar because what it is in a way is a feedback loop. We're gonna sit there, we're gonna say, okay, we, we're gonna collect resources, we're gonna skim through them, we're going to refine them, we're going to learn, and we're going to comp um, repeat this cycle, and we're going to dig in a little bit about how this cycle works. So the first step is to collect resources. So find introduction resources, often ones that start with the title, what if. So you're going to get a sampler. Now this doesn't have to be exhaustive. The idea is for you to know what are the most recommended and popular resources out there, just to get started. Don't worry about actually trying to learn the concept yet. Just get a sense of the landscape and a sense of what the choices are. Now, we're not going deep here while we're skimming these resources. This is just to help us evaluate what we're gonna focus on. So like Whitney said, don't worry about trying to learn it. Don't go too deep. We're literally skimming over them to get a sense. And here's the thing, at first, you don't know what you don't know. And as you're looking through these resources and evaluating, one of the things to, to look for is what concepts continue to come up, right? You might sit there and say like, there's a lot of stuff about storage. I see these themes, right? Okay, there's things about role-based access control. Should I pay attention to that? Here's the wonderful thing. Fundamentally, what's happening here is pattern recognition, which humans are really great at. That's what our, one of the things that's awesome about our prefrontal cortex that other mammals don't have. It helps us look for patterns. So we're saying, what are we seeing come up as patterns? Now, you kind of sit there and say, okay, with these resources, what assumed knowledge are they expecting with this? For me, when I was learning Kubernetes with my uh, application developer background, I hadn't ever worked with Linux. So when I, one of the first resources I worked with, it's like, how do you find what application image is running in a pod? Like, oh, all you do is run kubectl describe and then grep for the image, and I was just like, grep, what's that? And like, pipe grep this. I was like, I have no idea these language, this language is getting thrown at me. And honestly, I was so clueless that I didn't even know to look, like, oh, I need to learn more about Linux because I didn't know it was Linux was the thing I didn't know. <laughs> so um, I ended up backing out of trying to learn Kubernetes. I got a Linux command line book. I read a couple of chapters of that. And then I started my Kubernetes journey back up. What, and you want to sort of sit here and say what resources resonate with you personally, 
right? This may have to do with your learning style or your experience level, how much time you have available. And as we talk about this, you may be a beginner at the idea, you may come with a background of experience. This is all different kinds of stories. So what resonates to Whitney is different than what resonates to me is what different than resonates to you. You're the only one who can evaluate that. And then now, now we're gonna let Whitney talk is what we're gonna do. <laughs> now we'll take the resources we've collected in Skim and we're gonna narrow them down. So the idea here is like what Matt said, to identify the resources that resonate with you personally. So for example, to learn Kubernetes, I see a lot of people recommend to each other Go look, use Kubernetes the hard way. Go to Kelsey Hightower's resource. And I'm sure it's an incredible resource. But little baby Whitney two years ago who doesn't know what grep is, that resource is way, way above my head from back then. And only now do I feel it's in my zone of uh, proximal development. So now that we've collected the array of resources, we've skimmed through them, we've chosen ones that resonate with us, now it's time to learn. So. So the work of learning, to, uh, to learn consistently, the best strategy is to define bite-sized goals, achieve those reasonable goals, and then do it again. So remember to reach for knowledge that is in your zone of proximal development. And then, well, um, so the zone of proximal development are concepts that will challenge you, but are not so hard that they feel overwhelming. Look at all these loops. <laughs> We're just looping all over the place, it's phenomenal. So the next thing, you want to measure your progress to get a sense of accomplishment. I personally love my Anki flashcard deck, so it's spaced repetition study, and I study cards every morning when I get up. Um, I added a stats plugin too, so I have a GitHub style graph so I can see my progress and that I've studied every day. Other popular note taking and study tools are Notion and Obsidian. But maybe you're not that fancy. Maybe you want to handwrite your notes in a daily learning journal. Or maybe you keep a blog of what you learn each day. Like the, there are different ways of finding joy with it, and every way is valid. The goal here is to keep learning at a consistent pace and to get a sense of purpose and a feeling of success in the journey in itself and not in those far away goals. So years ago, there was this up and coming comic named Brad Isaac. He was a young comedian and somehow he found himself kind of backstage with legendary comedian Jerry Seinfeld. And he went to him and he just sort of came out and said, do you got any tips for an upcoming comedian? And Jerry said to him, he said, uh, the way to be a better comic was to write better jokes. But then he said, okay, how do you write better jokes? You write better jokes by writing a lot of jokes and by doing it every day. So what he said to him, he said, okay, you're gonna get yourself one of those big whole year long calendars. That's a whole year, not, not a flip one like in the picture, but you know, whole year one, put it up on a wall where you can see it. Get a big red magic marker. And every day that you write a joke, cross off that day. And then your whole, your only job is to not break the chain, right? Keep them going. And then you, as you continue to do it, you see this streak, you see this chain, and you don't want to break the chain, and it makes you feel good. Your only job is to not break the chain. And you notice that in any of that, nowhere did he focus on results. It was just doing. So you can do the same thing. You can say every day, I'm doing something with my learning journey. It doesn't mean I'm learning a lot. It doesn't mean that I actually accomplished, maybe, maybe I didn't accomplish anything, but I did something because when we get those streaks going, it makes us not want to break them and we build those patterns and that's what moves us along. So now, when you're gonna go through this, we're gonna ask a couple questions of you. Uh, you can answer them to yourself in your head because if we all answered them out loud at the same time, it would be chaos, but I don't know, that might be kind of fun. <laughs> Uh, and these are questions that will help evaluate how you're going to approach your learning and your, your uh, techniques. So right now, in your head, ask yourself, what is your own personal level of technology experience? So when I started learning Kubernetes, I didn't realize that a node is the same thing as a machine, is the same thing as a box, is the same thing as a worker, and all of those things just mean computer. <laughs> so I, I particularly had to choose learning source resources that have a begin, very beginner level. Manny, on the other hand, started learning Kubernetes from a dip, completely different perspective where he had a lot of experience with DevOps already. 
The point is, learning can begin from anywhere. And the next question you're going to ask is, how much time do you have to devote to learning? Some folks are in a place where you can do full time boot camp style learning, where you can devote, that's all that you're doing. Some of us are doing it maybe 10 minutes a week and anywhere in between. We have, we all live full lives that do other things. We have different responsibilities. We're in different places. There's no right answer, but you want to be realistic. So you set yourself up for success. You know, if you realistically can't devote more than a little bit of time a week, then don't create a plan that's, that's not going to allow for that. Right? So you want to make sure what you come up with is sustainable. Whatever that way, whatever that amount of time is, it will get you where you want to go. So the last question you want to ask yourself right now in your head is what is your learning style? Now, you may not know the answer to that, this one yet, but the good news is that's what we're about to talk about next. So as we talk about different learning styles, we're gonna focus on the VARC model. So VARC stands for, it's an acronym for visual, auditory, reading, writing, and the K is for kinesthetic. Or Kubernetes. <laughs> uh, these learning styles are not mutually exclusive. I personally think I'm both a visual learner and a reading writing learner. But Maddie identifies as an auditory learner and a kinesthetic learner. It actually worked out really well. <laughs> Another thing to note is that concepts will sink deeper when you consume the, the, your, your concepts learning more than one style, using more than one learning style at once. So if, for example, if you watch a video that engages you both visually and audit audibly, then you take that and then apply that knowledge kinesthetically, then that's gonna help that concept sink very deeply for you. Your learning style can also be situationally dependent. So maybe you learn one way at, with work concepts in a totally different way when you're doing your hobbies. So what type of learner are you? How do you know? Maddie and I are each gonna go, go over the four learning styles and ask you more questions for you to consider in your head to Did help you, you figure it out. Did you know there's gonna be so much homework in this talk? <laughs> so first let's talk about the visual learning style. How do you know this is you? <laughs> do you understand information better when it's presented in a visual way? Are you a doodler? Are you a list maker? Do you see patterns in things? Are arts, beauty, and aesthetics important to you? Do you enjoy consuming pictures, diagrams, maps, charts, and graphs? If so, you're a visual learner. Um, you have a superpower. So as you're learning a concept, draw out your understanding. Maybe assign colors to column, common themes in your notes. Your brain remembers colors very well, so use this to your advantage. On my phone, I organize my apps yeah. in folders according to color, yeah. Watch videos with a large graphic component, <coughs> lightboard videos. And uh, visual learners may need more time to process material, but then they often understand it more deeply. This is something I wish I knew sooner because in boot camp, I felt like it took me longer to understand the concepts than the people around me. But now I know once I do know something, it's really stuck in there and I can examine it from all angles. So if you are an auditory learner like me, here's some of the ways to find out if you are. Maybe you learn better when the subject is reinforced by sound. Like I really like reading, but audiobooks help me catch things better. Do you like to uh, talk things through? It's actually kind of funny, while we've been working on this deck, more often than not, I would be sitting there and, and talking to myself and sitting there, and there, or talking to Whitney and say, okay, sorry, I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud. I'm just thinking out loud. I'm just thinking out loud. And at a certain point, Whitney's like, well, you are an auditory learner. <laughs> um, <clears throat> another thing, if you're familiar with the idea of rubber duck debugging, if rubber duck debugging works really well for you, and, and that's the idea of that uh, someone, you know, a programmer came up, uh, to a senior programmer and, and asked for help with the problem and he had a person had a little rubber duck on the desk and said explain it to the duck uh -huh. and explained to the duck in the middle of explaining the duck figured out the solution we call that rubber duck debugging if that resonates with you you might be an auditory learner um, are you really great at verbally explaining your things is that where those go in if again like me i find myself often saying things like okay let's get this out of slack and get on zoom and use mouth words for a minute that is definitely an auditory type learner. Um, I don't know, I mean, maybe you create songs to help remember information, people oh, do that. I've done that. Oh yeah? Yeah. Let's hear it. <clears throat> 
I wish I was a Kubernetes baller. I wish I could install her. I wish I had a cube API I would call her. I wish I had an app that was fast and no crash and whose footprint was smaller. Boom. <laughs> Fun fact, fun fact, original title for this talk is I wish I was a Kubernetes baller, but <laughs> we, we felt, it felt like the, the other title might have gotten us through, but a little bit better. So if you are an auditory learner, um, how do you maximize that superpower? Well, one of the things is learning in groups because we can talk it out. So study groups, maybe a book club, you know, something, you know, get some study buddies. Um, another thing is, all of this material that we're providing here could be written in a blog post and you might read it, but we're sitting here listening to it be spoken. And this is a different way. So guest speakers, guest lecturers, go to meetups, all this stuff that's online. And uh, audiobook stuff, I talked before about how I really like to read. I mean, I like to read so much that when I was a kid, if I got in trouble, I got grounded from books, right? Because my parents knew they could ground me and I would just sit and read. Well, one of the things I've realized over the last few years as I've gotten into audiobooks is they resonate different, like I catch things. I will listen to some of my favorite books and, and, and catch stuff. These are books I've read dozens of times in my life. I'm like, oh, I didn't even notice that happened because I'm at the pace of the narrator. And also, you know, kind of explain things um, in your own voice. And I said, my dog knows a lot about Pulumi <laughs> because I explain a lot of stuff I'm trying to figure out to my one-year-old Australian Shepherd. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so is your learning style reading and writing? Here are some questions to help you figure it out. Do you prefer to learn through written words? Are you drawn to writing? Do you enjoy reading articles or books? Do you keep a journal? I keep a journal. <laughs> Are you likely to look up definitions? Do you Google everything? Do you make lists? Interestingly, this is a, these two styles, the visual style and reading writing style have some overlap. If this is you, you have a reading writing superpower. So here are some ways to take advantage of that. Read and write. Note taking is a powerful tool in your belt. For me, if I read only, the information goes in one eye and right out the other. It does not stay in there. But if mm -hmm. I read and take notes, it's a different story. Uh, join a book club. This is a fun way to reinforce your understanding. When taking notes, don't write word for word. Paraphrase the ideas in your own thoughts. This will help you to think critically about the information. Use flashcards. Give yourself opportunities to recall the information that you're learning. This will help strengthen the neural pathways that are forming in your brain. And then our final style is kinesthetic. And one of the way, some of the ways you can figure out if this is you is, do you learn by experiencing or doing things? I always think of kinesthetic also to me is a visceral learning, right? It's somatic, it's body, it's feeling. Uh, do you like to act out events or use your hands to help promote understanding? Uh, one of, uh, does it help you to draw things out? Now, one of the things is, I, I don't know if you know this or not, I didn't draw these pictures because I don't draw well, but I draw on whiteboards all the time, but never to create an artifact that makes sense to anybody. But I found in the days when we used to go out and do these things in person, I'd be sitting in a conference room trying to explain something and it's just a whole bunch of arrows and squiggles and doing whatever. And it's literally just a dry erase marker that's following my gestures. But it is a way for me to sort of take my physicality and go into that. Um, do you really want to have examples uh, especially if we're talking about technology in action, and like real examples, not like dog implements class animal, right? But like a real thing. Now, th that's saying, if, if, if that makes sense to you, like, good job, awesome. I don't, that does not help me learn. Um, the, the, you know, those pieces. Maybe you're good at applied activities, like, like painting or dancing or cooking, or maybe you are good at them, but you just like to do them a lot, <laughs> like, as maybe I do, right? <laughs> and do you have to actually practice something in order to do it. And for me, I found this to be very true. When I'm learning a new technology, I have to put it into a problem set that makes sense to me so that I can actually practice doing it. And the other thing is maybe, is it difficult for you to sit still for long periods of time? Have you noticed how Whitney has stood very, very still and has been great and I've been, and I'm like a conference speaker, I'm supposed to know how to move on a stage and I still wander around. So if any of those things are true, you may have the superpower of kinesthetic. So. 
how do we maximize that? So, and, and maybe writing code isn't the example, this is one, but if it's a code type thing, write code while you're learning. Go along with it. Actually practice while you're doing it. I also love turning learning into a game. Uh, there's lots of different ways you can do that. Uh, for quite some time, I had an online game show called DevOps Party Games, which was basically just making a lot of jokes about tech. One way to think about it, I used to, I used to say that I wanted to learn just enough about Kubernetes to make jokes about it. Well, you know what? That's actually not a bad way. You know, you turn it into a game, it keeps you kind of going. And, but think about your pace. We talked about how this visceral, kinetic, kinesthetic style of learning can actually be very tiring. So just like Whitney said in some of the other ones, it might take a little longer. On the other side, if you're kinesthetic, like, you know, kind of pace yourself because you're gonna get pretty exhausted. And look for real executing, um, hands-on ways to do things. So they might be online playgrounds, might be easy local things like Kind, you know, Minikube, something that's gonna let you actually just do this for real without having to like be given access to a giant production cluster and see what happens. That's actually a pretty very, that could be a very <laughs> visceral way to learn, but maybe I don't recommend it. Now, not to imply that Whitney and I are not real people. I'm a hologram. We are, we are so not real. <laughs> uh, we we kind of wanted to talk to a, uh, some folks out in the community mm -hmm. to get some thoughts on their journey and maybe some of their recommendations because again, everybody has some different stories. So um, one person that I spoke to was, uh, was Guinevere Sanger, who is a software engineer. Uh, Gwen's tech background, um, Again, career changer. She uh, did six months of a boot camp with uh, Ruby on Rails, front end stuff, and uh, learned Kubernetes as part of her internship. And I kind of asked, I said, you know, Gwen, what was a piece of advice that you got at first that was not helpful? And it was this, right? I'm sure we've all heard this too. Like, how do you learn things? Well, just go contribute to it, right? Well, the problem with that is, how do you, what does that mean, right? It, yeah, contributing to projects can be a great way to learn, but you need some guidance, you need something. So we kind of can run into that. And then, I, you know, kind of ask, so what was some of the hardest stuff? And I, I really like thinking about this because everybody has a different stumbling block. So Gwen said, I don't know, this idea that you SSH into a node, but then you kube cuddle exec into a pod. It's just like where we trip up. And every one of us out here has got a different story of the one thing where you're like, I don't know why that's just weird for me. And then kind of finally I was like, um, what was, what are the things, and you know, so everybody was always insisting that this is really, really hard. How many people have continually heard this? And even in a reassuring way of like, don't worry, don't worry, Kubernetes is really hard. Uh -huh. Okay, the problem with that is it kind of like when it says, a lot of times this is really when someone is sort of re referring to their in a, someone's inability to explain it. And I'm just as guilty as anyone else of like making jokes about Kubernetes being hard because it's funny. You know, I think we may have all seen Swift on security's tweet, which is, I think it was Swift, it might have been Swift or Ian, I, I now misremember, but said, I tried to explain Kubernetes to someone and now neither of us understands it. The reality is this is not actually true, right? Kubernetes isn't easy but it's not hard and it's not impossible. And it has a lot to do where this, this talk is about accessing learning resources, but those of us who are part of creating learning resources need to think about how we can make this stuff more inclusive. So now let's talk about Kat Cosgrove and her journey. Like me, Kat is a developer advocate who comes from a web developer background. So the unhelpful advice that Kat got when she was first learning is the same. Oh, this is always hard to learn. This well-intentioned piece of advice feels like a lack of consideration for learners. So instead, Kat says, it's important that new learners know that no one is an expert in every aspect of Kubernetes. This is something I wish I knew when I started out. Most, most folk, folks employed in the field likely know the fundamental concepts of Kubernetes, but they only have really deep knowledge in one or two aspects of it. So we also asked Kat, what is the hardest thing about learning Kubernetes when you first tackled it? And her reply, networking. She said, frankly, I'm still pretty convinced that networking is magic. It's not? <laughs> 
So Maddie and I also tweeted asking the community how they first learned Kubernetes. One of our first responses came from Lena Hall who said, I read a big percentage of Kubernetes documentation in 2015 in the last row of a sparsely populated <laughs> movie theater session. It was fun. Uh, this tweet leaves me with more questions than answers. What movie was playing at the time? Like, what, was it that boring? So uh, Tim Davis said, you know, uh, he says, I still think it's a bunch of smoke, mirrors, and a man behind the curtain. He said, I learned it from watching you. Okay, I still don't know it. Send help. And really, it's sort of like, you know, the, the, the man behind the curtain, Tim? Uh, we're, we're kidding. We're kidding a little bit. This is a line from The Wizard of Oz. But that said, you know, had to, had to kind of give a little, little bit of poke. But, but I think the, th the point here is that, again, as we continue to work, there's always still things where we don't completely understand. And then finally, I really love this tweet from Duffy. And he kind of said, you know, there are three ways that he, you know, kind of his story. Part of it was presentations from Kelsey Hightower. And this reminds me of something I just want to you know, call in and call out again. We talked about Kubernetes the hard way being not necessarily beginner friendly and everything like that. That is by no means anything to do with Kelsey. Kelsey is one of the most you know, accessible and creates all sorts of great content and is accessible to everybody. Um, well, that sounded more like everybody can just go to Kelsey's house and ask about Kubernetes. I don't think you can do that, but uh, it's very inclusive stuff. It's just that specific resource. But then I also really like this idea of like going into the Slack, but sometimes just by watching the questions and the answers other people have, which is mm -hmm. kind of a reiteration on why learning in the open and asking questions in public is really powerful because you'll actually get more answers yourself anyway, but it helps other people. And then also, you know, Duffy was you know, working actually on CoreOS. But I love this idea that you know, sharing with others is the most effective way to learn a thing. So we're here on the last day of KubeCon. We've seen a lot of amazing presentations from you know, some of the like, most advanced folks in our community that are you know, pushing the state of the art forward and know Kubernetes better than anyone we could think of. Every one of those people was where you are now where I am now. We've all been, they've all been somewhere. They got to where they are. <clears throat> and you're gonna get to where you need to be. And then you can help all the others. So let's go over some takeaways. So as we discussed at the beginning, when you choose educational resources to start with, consider three things. Consider your own personal knowledge level, the amount of time you have to devote to learning, and your learning style. Track your study habits so that you have a sense of purpose and a feeling of success in the journey itself. Remember, it's not about the results. Learning is a lifelong process. No one is perfect, so if you miss some study days, be kind to yourself and get back to studying. Life is messy and complicated, and it can vary from moment to moment. This is OK. You know, earlier we said, you don't know what you don't know. Well, I'll tell you who do, does know what you don't know, a mentor. So, <laughs> uh, sorry. And so your mentor can give you amazing perspective and guidance about what is the next best step. And then finally, there's no getting around it. Deep learning takes time. So accept that, build a good pattern, and you can do it. So this is our reference slide. You can feel free to take a picture, but don't worry, I'm gonna give you a better way to get at these references. So uh, either that or everybody just like take very copious notes really quickly of all <laughs> these details. But we've got a lot of background articles on things that we've done. But to make life even easier, you can go to this bit.ly or this QR code will take you to, um, to where you can get the slides as well as on the website uh, that has a link to all the resources that we refer to plus a bunch of other great ones. And speaking of even more resources, in this very room at uh, 455, there's gonna be a great panel called Navigating the CNCF Landscape the Right Way. I swear, I think the program committee put them together, but we didn't name the things together. <laughs> and that's gonna be a panel that's really focusing on some specific resources and suggestions. So sort of taking some of these ideas, so giving you some great things to add to your collecting of resources. So I highly recommend everybody come back for that panel. It's even in the same room. I mean, you have to wait a long time to sit in here, so maybe go do something else for a little bit. But uh, come on back again. Uh, so my name is 
Matt Stratton, and this is... And I'm Whitney Lee. This has been super fun. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> we did it. I think if people have questions, first of all, you can find us on Twitter. We'll be hanging out up here if anybody wants to, to take some questions and stuff, but I think they're, uh, we went right up to the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.